Hi, I'm Tony Fry. I'm talking to you from my home in Tasmania about a new political imagination making the case, the book I've written with Madina Tasilova that's just about to be published. Uh, what I'm going to do is to uh, say a little bit about the ambitions and intent of the book, then a, um, a short summary of the content and finally a few prompts to issues that we can talk about. So the ambitions, uh, they all go to the failure of politics in the end times in which we exist uh, and that applies to everybody everywhere. The intention is to expose the failure of all currently available politics to comprehend and address the scale complexity of the global relational problems putting our planet, life on our planet at risk. Intention two exposes the lack of political imagination of political leadership and culture. Current political ideologies and philosophies cannot deliver viable futures and this includes democracy. The, the third intention argues that a new political imagination is essential in the creation of a vocabulary of new concepts, ideas, transformative, transformative practices to make a future politics in a condition of deep and potentially terminal crises possible. In support of our argument, we are analytically interrogating the ways in which the nature of existing politics structurally, ideologically, conceptually and institutionally form a picture of what a new political imagination has to transcend. Our ambition aims to advance an epistemological framework that makes it possible to rethink the forms and characters of the political. This in ways not too, not delimited by Eurocentric and Euromodern perspectives. Doing this meant going beyond the limits of current decolonial discourse and fully embracing rational epistemologies. The ambition of the exercise goes to giving a clear account of how imagination has been historically understood to expose, to expose the degree of difference and malleability it has. There is no simple appeal to imagination. Finally, the aim is to hope to prompt others to think critically, futurally, towards action for future sustainment. Now to look at the book very briefly. Introduction, the political deformation of now. These are really kind of a series of positions. Uh, all, all politics, uh, including democracy, are seen as being out of step with the crisis. That is our existential condition of being in the world now. So that crisis is of enormous complexity. It is of a complexity beyond our ability to understand the complex. The second point is we have a crisis of crisis. And what that actually means uh, is that there is an enormous relational crisis and there are crises that are made present but we do not have an ability to represent the extent and the complexity of the crisis in which we exist. So the crisis of crisis, in a sense, is a collision between the biophysical, psychological crisis of being now uh, and a representational crisis. They are indivisible from each other. The next point, position point, uh, steps towards making new imagination. Uh, and that confronts what it is 
what is rather to be imagined. In essence, the defuturing life forces of the compound crisis that is, in a sense, intrinsic to the sum of all crises. Uh, you should understand our position rejects a kind of a utopianism, dreams without the ability to deliver them, uh, and also rejects a, a dystopic, nihilistic response to the situation. We try to forge a way that, in a sense, is between or above both. So the first chapter goes to a series of openings in relation to what is critical and criticality. It's set against a backdrop of crises, names that you're familiar with, uh, the Anthropocene, the sixth extinction event, biophysical uh, a collapse associated with it, and the relation of the transhuman as a marker of the beginning of our species fragmentation. Obviously there are more, but you know, what we're trying to do is to gather and address the end times in relation to what they constitute together. Recognising that we are at the end of the idea of progress, that we exist in a condition of unsettlement, but be it biophysically, geographically, or psychologically. We have a crisis of blind leadership. There is not a single institution or leader on this planet at the moment who is confronting what has to be confronted and leading towards an engagement that can in any way address the scale of the problem. We also have a problem of chronophobia our fear of time, our illusion of permanence. And that is invisible from this crisis of leadership because their vision is incredibly restricted. Then there is the kind of the, the problem of the unknowing of de-relational knowledge. In other words, we are still trapped in disciplinary frameworks that prevent us engaging and understanding relational complexity. And then there is the fragmentation of the world order. The, the, the notion of how the world in relation to power has been configured is actually disintegrating. So it becomes part of the unknown, part of the unsettled. So all this, in a sense, is just a small snapshot of what I've described as the, the complexity of complexity. In relation to all of this, our second chapter goes to a lexicon of analytics. Uh, framed by openings, we work through confrontations with what I've just been describing, the fracturing of the world order, equally changing climate, it implies a changing not just of you know atmospheric and climatic condition but it actually changes everything the, the extent of climate change in a sense is beyond its scientific configuration and then there is the associated structural conditions of conflict which are going to dramatically increase through all the fracturings that I've talked about so what is, the ontic, is changing and will produce ontological ruptures and changes in our species. So that is the scale of what is unsettling. So making sense of this situation, while making sense of what we are becoming, has to be generative of what we call a negotiation of an epistemological maze, which in a sense is a crisis of a collision of pluralisms. 
what we do is to present nine pathways through that maze and the last one centering on the imperative of unlearning in order to be able to relearn a new learning. In other words, we have to be able to unburden some of the fundamental ways in which we know. And that also has a kind of an implication for the university. Effectively, the university needs to be remade. It is of the past. It is about replicating the world that exists rather than creating the world in within the world which will sustain us. Okay, chapter three is a narrative of the gatherings of the political. And what we mean by gatherings is both collecting together and comprehending. The two meanings of the world fusing in one. We open by bringing the concept of the political from Carl Schmitt into a collision with the break up and breakdown of politics within and between nations. Again, part of the crisis. So just as the future is littered with obstacles that have to be navigated through the things that we've thrown into it, so too is the political. The kind of obstacles include, you know, what is now emerging as techno-governmentality. The, the, the condition of inoperative community and the, the wasteland of post-democratic democracy. So it isn't a question of throwing up a new political imagination in a space which is open. It is a space which is kind of littered with obstacles to overcome. All of this goes to the content of chapter four, which is about imagining otherwise. It recognises that the political imagination cannot arrive out of a, a social abstract act of contemplation as the thing in itself. Imagination does not magically emanate from an eight spirit of creativity. Rather, it comes out of a situated context that constitutes the world of its and our formation in difference. This changes historically and culturally. The postmodern imagination, the imagination of Euromodernity, the imagination of the technological semiosphere cannot deliver a future political imagination. It follows that this imagination has to break with the likes of post-Marxist, post-liberal, post-colonial imaginations. We have to be able, in a sense, to liberate ourselves from this political baggage. So the last chapter uh, is towards the research agenda and what there is actually to research in relation to the agenda. The approach really goes to, first of all, part one, mapping the obstacles in relation to thinking about a course towards the future, the kind of things I've just been talking about. And then the second is replying to that mapping in the form of events. And events, I'm not going to try to unpack that term now, but I'm not taking it in a kind of a conventional, literal sense. And just to give you a clue on that, you know, the primary event that we are within is being itself. So that um, delivers uh, three particular agendas. A critique of the situated politics of the status quo in relation to the mapping. Uh, the construction of conditions in which imagination is possible. And the creation of staged events uh, in the domain of action research. So none of this adds up to us trying to begin this process with a solution. We are not a delivering a new political imagination. We are delivering a process that can help us work towards its creation. Finally, the book 
has been a product of continual exchange and dialogue between the two of us. It reflects what we think without, without the assumption that there are definitive answers to what it states. It is, in many respects, an exploration and an experiment. Our aim and hope is that our conversation prompts others to think critically and futurally and move towards the discovery of means of taking transformative action. For there to be a future with a future for us collectively over time, it has to be made in the knowledge that the history of our species and the attainment of things deemed necessary confront the realisation of the impossible. Recognising that retrospectively the history of our species is the history of the attainment of what at the time seems impossible. That's a very important corrective. So, finally, the last few words go to prompting issues that we can talk about. Here are four possibilities. But before considering the most important thing to grasp, is that a new political imagination is not a product of a moment of inspiration or insight, a flash of light where uh, solutions are revealed, but rather a process of discovery, a task, an action of intellectual labour. So, one issue, dealing with the complexity of complexity. This not only demands knowing, unknowing, unlearning and new learning, but as I've indicated, the abandonment of disciplinary affiliations that acknowledge what Lewis Gordon names as disciplinary decadence, that is, those divisions of knowledge that obstruct and refuse relational knowledge and understanding. Next one, a question you can think and feel, the disjuncture between the imperatives which met or unmet will determine our future as a species, among species, and the political agenda of national and international leadership. How do we, in a sense, constitute a discourse that actually can be put in front of political institutions and leaders? What currently is happening is completely failing to do that. Issue number three. Do you agree that the inability of all the political philosophies and ideologies, including de democracy, to create conditions that will secure a viable future is not external to the criticality of the crisis and the end times, but elemental to it? The last one. To close, we assert the absolute need for a new political imagination. Recognising imagination is not a mental facility able to be appealed to, as I've been indicating, as if it were historically and universally the same across all time and cultures. It is fundamentally and prefiguratively primary uh, and essential for the possibility of redirective change out of specific conditions that are negating the future. So that is, in a sense, the frame, the context out of which the imagination has to be able to be, um, to be made and emerge. So that's all for now. I look forward to talking to you with Medina in a few days' time. Cheers. Bye-bye.